on this week's episode of Bayou Wild TV. All right, so here we are at the farm. This is one of our plots here in Grand Isle. You can also see we get a lot of wind down here, which rocks the cages and gives the oysters their safety. I guess just educate yourself and teach yourself about the environment. It, it works together so much. Um, so it goes beyond oysters. Find something that you like and learn about it and do what you can. Everybody has different things that they enjoy, so just do, do your part. From Louisiana waters to your local restaurants, coming up. Closed captioning is brought to you by Global Outdoors. Find your next adventure and share your experiences with others by downloading the Global Outdoors mobile app or visiting globaloutdoors.com. Every day, we strive to preserve traditions that have spanned generations. Around every turn of the bayou, Mother Nature reveals unique people, places, and experiences and the bounty of animals and fish. Well, in Louisiana, we just call that land yak. I'm Don Debut. I'm Chris Lacop. I'm Captain Martha Spencer. Join us as we document the adventure, sportsmanship, and heritage that make us Bayou Wild. Nearly a year has passed since Hurricane Ida rocked the town of Grand Isle, Louisiana. To this day, there's still work to be done to rebuild this barrier island community. This is Louisiana's last inhabited barrier island. Grand Isle wasn't here. Lafitte and New Orleans would have been hit even harder than they were from Ida. But history has shown that no matter the setback Louisianians have endured, fishing industries have progressed. There's oyster farmers and there's oyster fishermen. Is that the same thing and is it required to be? Well, there's really no actual wild reefs. Even the so-called wild oysters are what are caught on the bottom. You still are putting that shell there. So there is a little bit of you know husbandry and farming involved even in maintaining a bottom reef and causing oysters to you know, reproduce and um, repopulate. We just are a little bit more specific about it and we put the oysters in the cages, not on the bottom. So whether it's on the top or bottom, it still is farming. In Louisiana, we live to cook. And we know a little Louisiana flavor brings any meal to life. Whether it's Friday's fish fry or Tuesday's crispy chicken, with Louisiana fish fry, you can turn any meal into a bona fide family favorite. Let's all Louisiana. This is Louisiana's last inhabited barrier island. We kind of take it upon ourselves to be defenders of the coast. And if Grand Isle wasn't here, Lafitte and New Orleans would have been hit even harder than they were from Ida.
you have to stick together down here because if you haven't experienced trouble yet, just wait. Like, it, it's coming, so we have to rely on each other. We're down here in Grand Isle, Louisiana, a place hit very hard by Hurricane Ida, but things are bouncing back and we're here learning all about the oyster fishery and about farming oysters right here in our backyard. Today we're going to learn a non-traditional way of oyster farming, a process that involves a much more scientific approach to harvesting these salty delicacies. This is kind of what's left over of the oyster nursery that we had. Uh, before the storm. But normally we would have bottles in each one of these slots flowing seawater up through there feeding the oysters. And you can look in this tray where the discharge is just from flowing the seawater you can see all the little baby oysters that that stuck in here. When we spawn the oysters and the oysters are ready to set we introduce them to sand that it's basically ground oyster shell that's 250 to 300 microns. So it's only big enough for one oyster to attach to that one grain of sand. And that's what allows us to have the individual oysters that we put into the cages. So I was born in Northeast Ohio on the Great Lakes and grew up fishing and seeing my grandpa go on deep sea fishing charters. He'd always, him and my grandma would always go to Jamaica and they'd bring back sailfish and he had sailfish mounted on the wall and a mackerel and a tuna. And, you know, I always looked up to him and just wanted to fish in, in the ocean. You know, that's, that's, it was just kind of like my dream growing up. And then over the course of time, I end up coming down to New Orleans to do relief work after Katrina, just doing volunteer. After being in the city, being basically landlocked for you know two years with that project, I ran down to Homa. I was like, I gotta get by the coast, I gotta get by water. Started working with the fishermen down there and I had this really old boat. I was trying to figure out if I could sell like $5 a crab like at the dock. I didn't know how any of this stuff worked. I just wanted to like supplement my habit. You know, I just wanted to try to figure out how I could get some sort of gas money some way. That led me into fishing oysters and then just really getting curious about like, how do they reproduce? How do they get here? They don't move, you know, and what, and then the more you study it, you realize there is no downside to oysters. They protect the coast, they improve the water quality, they sequester carbon, you know, and they're edible. Before visiting the oyster farms, Scott shared information on the science behind oysters a process state biologists refer to as alternative oyster culture. And a lot like agriculture, oyster farming begins with seeds. This is some of the seed that died in Ida. But what we would normally do, we don't have any live seed to show you right now, but as the oysters grow, this, this is the individual oysters that set on the small grains of sand. And as the oyster grows, we start running it through different sieves like this let the small stuff fall out the bottom and then catch the larger oysters as they grow. That's mainly what we do until it hits market size. Well, I was a huge biology nerd in high school. I was probably my favorite science class to take, but I didn't know how much I could actually learn about oysters today and how much there was to learn about mollusks. One adult oyster filters or it basically, you know, breathes about 50 gallons of water per day. Just one adult oyster. So you start having millions of oysters, it really has an impact on the water quality. This is baby food for oysters. This is where they start making algae that is grown for the oyster larva. And these small jars will be transferred into the larger algae production room right around the corner. 
So from the little bottles of algae, it comes into here and they grow bigger volumes of algae to feed all the tanks of larva and the brood stock and everything else. There was a lot of science in it. Um, I ended up having a lot more questions than I thought I would and all of them were answered. Um, I could probably ask another dozen if I sit here thinking long enough. These are the mommies and daddies. But if you, if you look at them, some of them are open. See, so they're, they're feeding. So that algae that we saw in the other room will be pumped into this water to keep them alive. And this water in this tank is chilled. And basically what they can do in this tank is mimic different times of the year. So you can, you can mimic different times of the year. So we're trying to make them think spring's coming earlier right now. And we can spawn them faster that way. Coming up next. All right, so here we are at the farm. This is one of our plots here in Grand Isle. You can also see we get a lot of wind down here, which rocks the cages and gives the oysters their signature shape. One of the reasons why Double D has been around for 50 years is because we are consistent with what built the business. And we go to great lengths to make sure that when you bring a, a deer or a hog or whatever it may be, your meat stays your meat all the way through the process. But we want to be as true to the original intent, which is a local meat company. And, and that's something that we want to maintain for as long as the Lord lets us do it. Some things in life smell delicious. Others, not so much like a gas leak. Propane, for instance, is naturally odorless. That's why we add strong odorants to alert you if there is a leak. So if you ever smell gas, turn your system off at the tank and call your propane dealer immediately. Propane is a safe and exceptional fuel, and we want to keep it that way. Delta Marina is Plaquemines Parish fishing one-stop. Get live bait, fuel, ice, tackle, and marine supplies. Then launch into the world's most productive saltwater fishing. Return to the fishing cleaning station, relax in first-class cabins overlooking the bayou, all in Delta Marina's safety video monitored parking lot. Need a fishing charter guide? Delta Marina can hook you up. Cook your catch in your kitchenette or dine in the upstairs restaurant. Visit Delta Marina for a day or a week. Stop in just off Highway 11 down Rosemary Drive in Empire. Visit the deltamarina.com. Continuing this week's episode. We are here at the Oyster Hatchery, the Wildlife and Fisheries Oyster Hatchery in Grand Isle. What you're seeing behind me is basically the baby food room. This is all different styles and varieties of algae being grown to feed the baby oysters. These are the mommies and daddies. And basically what they can do in this tank is mimic different times of the year. And we can spawn them faster that way. Today we're visiting with Scott Morer and the Louisiana Oyster Company. He's going to introduce us to some innovative science behind growing a Louisiana oyster. So there's, there's two different types of oysters that we actually raise. One is a diploid and one's a triploid. The diploid is what occurs naturally in the wild and it has two sets of chromosomes. A triploid has three sets of chromosomes and that's achieved by taking an oyster that has two sets, breeding it with an oyster that has four sets. When they get together, it makes an oyster that has three sets of chromosomes. It's a triploid. It grows fat and fast. So it's a natural product. It's more like taking a horse and a donkey and making a mule. of our plots here in Grand Isle. 
Um, we like this location right here for two reasons. Uh, first of all, you can walk it. It's fairly shallow, so we can get off the boat and work it pretty easily. And secondly, right past that bridge is the Gulf of Mexico, so we get Gulf of Mexico clean water fresh coming in right in the pass. And you can also see we get a lot of wind down here, which rocks the cages and gives the oysters their signature shape. It's a three finger oyster, yep. but that's kind of the size that the restaurants want. That's about the size of a soup spoon. So that's, you know, that, that's the size of meat that we're looking for. I, I learned of kind of the, the process and the delicacy of, of shellfish, uh, how long they take to grow and all the variables that go into making a good oyster or growing a good oyster and what we have control of and what we don't. There's a lot of factors that affect the taste. The fact that we have them up off the bottom, oysters eat just algae, they eat phytoplankton and most of the photosynthesis happens in the top two feet of the water. So by raising the oyster off the bottom, putting it in a floating cage, you're giving it the best food. It doesn't have to fight the sediment to get its food. Um, so. I think it does result in a cleaner taste. Because they have a thinner shell, you can use a thinner knife to get in there. And to me, they're easier to open once you kind of understand how to open them. You get more understanding of where your food comes from and why it's so good and why it's so important to just support the industries that are so close to home. I mean, it was literally right out of the water. But. How salty? How salty was it? I mean, what am salty, I? Salty or salty, salty or like salty, salty, salty. If that was chilled, it would be perfect. Yeah. Like perfect. I mean, it's you know, it's it's kind of like water temperature. You like yeah. it colder. Yeah. But the the like very salty. We're gonna actually tell you how salty these oysters are. We actually measure how salty the water is. So today it looks like it's right around 30 parts per thousand. Which is good. That's salty. Yeah. yeah. That's real salty. That's real, that's salty salty. Yeah. I wasn't sure if I was just, you know, blowing smoke saying it was a really salty oyster because it was coming right out of the water. But indeed, we, we did a little salinity test and found out that any oyster you get this year is gonna be a really, really good one. We love our children. We protect them. We guide them. We prepare them for life in the world. With all that we do, from deep in our hearts, we cannot control all things. Life-threatening illnesses and disabilities affect far too many of our children each year. While we cannot change the circumstance, we can make dreams come true. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nonprofit organization fulfilling dreams for hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Visit huntofalifetime.org to learn how you can make a difference. It's easy to see why it's worth the trip to Central Arkansas for the opening of early season Speckle Belly Goose in Stuttgart.
And welcome to the kitchen of Chef John Foltz here at White Oak Plantation in Baton Rouge. Chef, we got another mouth-watering <laughs> recipe today. What are we going to be cooking? Man, I love to hear when somebody tells me, Don Dubuque's coming to White Oak. Boy, I love good, to hear it, too. <laughs> that's a good day. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you're an oyster lover, right? Who huh? am I from way uh, back? You, you know, one of the things that I think is so intriguing about Louisiana is that we have such a wide scope of seafood, as you know better than anybody, uh, that people are constantly looking to share their recipes of what they're doing with redfish or what they're doing with speckled trout or whatever, oysters included. And we do a lot of oysters at, uh, at Revolution. So I'm starting off in this black, uh, black iron skillet and I'm gonna put butter in here. And when the butter hits this skillet, uh, you know, you're gonna get a nice browning, which is, uh, which is important uh, in the oyster pan rolls. Now, why they call it the pan rolls is I guess just because they're doing it over a nice hot open fire. You're browning your butter first and nothing is better flavored in a dish than burned or brown butter. You know that, right? Huh? So we're gonna have a little bit of, uh, of this in here. And then of course we have the seasonings I'm gonna put in. And the seasonings, of, of course in Louisiana we can put anything we want, but a little bay leaf, a little shallots, a little garlic, a little green onion. that flour right in front, just kind of dust about half of it and then we're gonna make a little light brown, a little light roux. We're not gonna make, a, that's plenty right there. And I'm gonna just swirl that around a little bit. So I don't want to brown it too much. I want you to put a little bit of that red paprika in here, about half of it, because the oyster pan roast is always a reddish uh, color. So you wanna put that paprika in there to give it that color. Some people think it's tomato, but it's not. It's just that fire roasted. Uh, a little bit of that oyster liquid, you see it right there? You can pour it all in there. You can pour it all in. So this is where we're gonna make our sauce. So that roux's gonna thicken beautifully. Uh, we're gonna move that around nicely. Now it's got that good oyster flavor. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna sacrifice half of those oysters and half of that crab meat in here. Just dump about half of those oysters in. In fact, I'll help you out there. That's good enough right there. And of course, these are just shucked last night. Now you say uh, sacrifice, yeah, we're we, not getting rid no, of this. Oh, no, no, okay. we're just gonna, okay. we just gonna just cook these to sacrifice it to flavor. We always keep half of it for the finished dish. So you already know this is gonna be good, huh? Oysters mm -hmm. and lump crab. Ooh, how can you go wrong? <laughs> so you see that beautiful orange color? Now, Don, give me about half of that cream you have right there in that little cream pitcher. Just dump it on in there like that. That's about right. I'll swirl that around and give me the rest of that paprika. So I want that nice rusty color. You can put a couple pinches of that parsley right there if you don't mind. And I'm gonna put a little Worcestershire sauce, which is always good. Could you use shrimp or crawfish instead of oh. the crab? Oh my God, sure you can. So Don, if you pick up that little platter right there and, uh, and I'll, and look at here guys. Now this is a dish that you can put in the oven with a little Parmesan cheese on top of it if you want to make a, like a gratin and you serve it with a little croutons. And down, you can put a little sprinkle of that beautiful green parsley. It's a unique and uh, historic dish with two chefs trying to decide for, that, for themselves who had the best oyster dish. And you know what? The guy in New York was uh, behind, no the eight, chance. behind the eight ball from the beginning. We declare it the winner. <laughs> right here from the kitchen of John Foltz, <laughs> White Oak Plant. Oyster pan rolls. In 1967, Dutch Stagner realized his dream to run his own meat market. Fifty years and three generations later, Double D and the Stagner family still operate with Dutch's original commitment to quality. Pick up some Double D sausage today and share your good times with us on Facebook. In Louisiana, we live to cook, and we know a little Louisiana flavor brings any meal to life. Whether it's Friday's fish fry or Tuesday's crispy chicken, with Louisiana fish fry, you can turn any meal into a bona fide family favorite. Let's all Louisiana. Outdoorsmen, athletes, and parents know the importance of Florida water to stay cool. 
Whether you're on the water, on the job, at the gym, or on the ball field, keeping cool just got simple with Cool Blue products. Cool Blue refreshing face and body wipes are for everyone. Use them at home, at work, or at play to clean up, cool down, and stay refreshed. Find Cool Blue refreshing wipes and misty spray at Rouse's Markets or online at coolblueproducts.com. It's seven months post Hurricane Ida and we're here down in Grand Isle. I'm gonna show you what this and this have in common. Yeah, so th this, is, this is the traditional way of, of planting oysters is you throw limestone or shell back into the water. And in this case, after the storm, we have tile and storm debris that we throw back out there. And when the oysters get milky, that larva will swim around and look for something to attach to. So that's why it's important to put the shells back into the water or put limestone or something for them to attach to. And this is my neighbor, this is Mr. Floyd Lasang right here, and he's taken this out a few buckets at a time to put on his lease. So any kind of debris that fell into the water could you know, potentially be a home to a new reef. Who knew there was so much science in oyster farming? The struggle to keep oysters thriving requires a balance between the natural and the innovative. I guess just educate yourself and teach yourself about the environment. It, it works together so much. I'm starting to forage sea succulents on the island that I never knew were here. Um, so it goes beyond oysters. Find something that you like and learn about it and do what you can. Everybody has different things that they enjoy, so just do, do your part. Coming from somewhere else and living in Louisiana, again, continuously uh, teaches me about where my food comes from. And that's been from the fish I catch, to the deer I shoot, to the birds I hunt. And, and now even the oysters and the shellfish that we raise here, which is something I didn't know much about, um, we've covered everything now from soft shell crawfish to how they harvest oysters the new school way, which I think is a very productive and interesting way they do it. I call the waters around here magical. You know, when, when the water's right, I mean, the oysters just taste amazing. There's fish going all over the place. It's just, it really is just, there's no place like it. So next time you eat a fresh Louisiana oyster, think of the dedication involved, keeping our adventure, sportsmanship, and heritage by you wild. Mm -hmm.